plug in. Website TNTradio.live. Check it out. Today's news talk radio. It's the coolest. TNT. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. Uh, I want to be uh, talking right now to Matt Nielsen. He is a political analyst based in Sweden. Uh, Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Firstly, I want to get your comments on the uh, retirement of Victoria Newland. I'm sure you're as shocked as I am, Matt. Uh, and, and yeah, they're opening up a helpline uh, for neocons uh, around America to deal with the with the fallout of this. Well, it's uh, I, I guess since Blinken was the one Sorry, who announced ahead. it. Yeah, since Blinken announced it, I'm guessing she didn't go voluntarily, but. Uh, the way I see it, I mean, I'm just speculating here because obviously I don't have any facts and I haven't really been had the time to look into it uh, in any detail. But the first thought that comes to mind is uh, perhaps that rat is, uh, the rats are leaving the ship. Uh, maybe this is an admittance of failure on, on behalf of Newland's strategy on uh, getting Russia to... Uh, enter a war and then after russia has entered the war trying to defeat russia by way of sanction and by way of militarily supporting ukraine and i that strategy has for uh, at least some of us uh, obviously been a mistake it's it's not working and right now ukraine is, is uh, bleeding itself dry against an immovable wall that is the russian military uh, and a military militarized russian economy so newland leaving might be a sign that uh, the united states is getting ready to abandon yet another ally like they uh, you know like they abandoned uh, the kurds or the south vietnamese or afghanistan and uh, now the time has come to abandon the ukrainians uh, who knows but uh, i mean he, it's she's only 62 so so given given the fact that all american politicians are above 80 uh, it's way too young for her to retire voluntarily so maybe she's being pushed out uh, as part of a purge that means uh, america might be trying some other type of policy hopefully it will be a sane policy uh, and not a further commitment to war but Considering the commitment bias amongst the American politicians, uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be overly confident TNT's about that. TNT's Timothy so, Shit. All I know is that she's out, and uh, by way of this, uh, she she has uh, her policies has been a failure. She, she uh, Russia isn't weakened, and uh, Ukraine doesn't really have any future uh, to continue the war against Russia it's uh, it's going to be left it's going to be left by america and the newland policy will in hindsight be only reef to the ukrainian nation i think in in a few years time newland will be cursed uh amongst most ukrainian citizens because she she created a mess and uh, the european Pol politicians will be the ones who are stuck with this mess. It's not going to be Newland or America that's going to be paying the highest price for a failed Ukrainian state. It's going to be Ukraine's closest neighbors, and that's the European Union. The European Union will be paying the highest price because they will be taking on Ukrainian refugees. They will be the ones who will need to mainly take responsibility for rebuilding Ukraine. Plus, the European Union have lost cheap Russian energy and a trading partner in Russia. And they might even risk losing China as a trading par partner, all due to the policy that Newland and her neocons try to implement. So I'm hoping that her leaving the scene will open up for a more reasonable and realistic American policy. Perhaps there are still some sane people within the Ukraine, uh, within the U.S. government, and these same people are trying to affirm control. So they've given Victoria an offer she couldn't refuse: either you resign now, 
or we're going to present some dirt on you that's going to make you force you to resign. So it's better if you resign now. And Blinken announced that. But uh, once again, it's uh, it's a time will tell situation uh, concerning concerning the new land issue. But uh, and Western Europe ha- has no interest in escalating the Ukraine war. Uh, especially with this discussion going on about exchanging long-range missiles. And uh, it's g- once Victoria leaves, I think the European politicians might follow Schultz in realizing that America is slowly but surely abandoning its support. So both... Uh, Western diplomats and Western think tanks might reassess the fact that uh, sanctions aren't the best solution and escalatory actions aren't the best solutions. The signal that is being sent by removing Newland is probably one uh, that will do good in rousing a bit of... uh, some of the European politicians who are still stuck in a desire to regime change Moscow, uh, uh, even as as silly as, as that is, there are probably some politicians who believe it's possible. As there are some politicians in Europe who still believe that a military victory is, is on the cards for uh, Western Europe in Ukraine. Which also, of course, is silly because uh, NATO's NATO and the West's both soft power and hard power have failed miserably, and uh, global trade and uh, I would say the wealth, global welfare, are are uh, crumbling in this process. So uh, we'll we'll see what happens, but uh, military in- interventions. Uh, will hopefully be gone with Newland leaving. Uh, I, I, I doubt it, but uh, one, one can always be hopeful. Yeah, a lot of this, uh, Matt's is face-saving exercise. Uh, it seems like they're so well dug in on this political, so much political capital has been expended on this, uh, that everybody's put themselves right out over the edge now for two years. They've staked so much financially and politically it's very hard to pull back and i think the other problem here matt says uh, when you break off diplomatic relations uh with a superpower like russia and there's there's no communication going on uh you, you, they sort of languish in their own sort of intellectual ghetto uh in europe and n- there's no other influences coming in to temper that and so it's just kind of gotten out of control, I think. The whole sort of Ukraine extravaganza, uh, this sort of NATO, ch- you know, chest thumping. And it's very hard to walk back. It's very hard to walk back now. It's been two years. So I, I think the penny's starting to drop. The Germans, uh, Schultz, as you said, his comments are, you know, completely, I think, uh, you know, hitting the brakes. Uh, this is the same Olaf Schultz that was stumping for, you know, bigger involvement in the war, Germans' military buildup. You remember that not so long ago? Very different I, I tone right now, Mads. Go ahead. And and I I think that what you're saying is, uh, if you look at it psychologically, you have this issue of uh, commitment biases. And on an individual level, for you and me, it, it can be a commitment bias, Can be it can be a barrier for our personal growth. Uh, you have to be able to acknowledge past flaws and uh, past bad behaviors in order to better yourself and and be adaptive because the gain on a personal level is a better self-insight that will help us make better decisions in our lives, thinking critically and thinking logically and questioning our previous decisions. The problem is that commitment bias becomes a great issue when someone is in a position of power. And these people who are in a position of power are just like you and me. They have commitment bias issues as well. So, I mean, 
if this this biases occurs in organizations where the decision maker is questioning isn't questioning their own idea it means that the behavior of governmental policies being put forth is something where a politician will go against the insights and the recommendations of its intelligence community and that that will this commitment bias will result in poor decision makings and these de decisions are very very uh, important for nations as a whole and and for uh, the commitment of i mean the future of the whole world basically and what's happening now is that we lost we lost this uh, issue between the great superpowers and some in in a certain sense i wish we were back during the cold war days because during the cold war days you had an open dialogue uh, i know for a fact that back during the cold war individual diplomats could go out in different countries and meet with representatives of the soviet union they could sit down at a bar have a beer have a discussion talk to each other and say what's the official issue okay but between you and me what would you say is going to happen there were open lines of communications on every level between the west and the soviet union today these communications are cut for example on the diplomatic scene in sweden where you where you have these meetings the russian and the chinese and the iranian these representatives no are no longer in attendance which isn't very good because if the personal com lines of communications are cut that means that the information going to decision to the decision makers will remain flawed and the decisions of the western powers will also be flawed and by that by flawed you it could well result in an escalation of the war and um so ho ho hopefully lines of communications will open up again and otherwise i i would say that we we, we could come to to a situation where public opinion uh exerts suddenly exerts a powerful force on the question of war and peace and national security it could be that that a citizenry high on propaganda could start calling for a war on russia and then it would be very very difficult for the politicians to step back from from uh, from these demands from the public because average person on the street uh aren't really that interested in foreign policy and national security it's always been questions that have been above the public fray it's been in the domain of diplomats and intelligence agents and career specialists uh but but today everyone can take part in the foreign policy and national security discussions due to social media and due to a new situation concerning news and if the leaders don't listen to this it means that they could suddenly be pushed into situations by a public opinion and the politicians and the career diplomats need to be the same people in the room but more than often today they are not the same people anymore and it's it's become the other way around public opinion is the one that's standing for some sanity public opinion is now saying perhaps we should stop bombing gaza and committing genocide in gaza perhaps we shouldn't sacrifice any more ukrainian young men men in a war that's unwinnable and this this isn't really this isn't really a good thing it it's just just proves that the politicians uh, politicians uh, commitment bias is so strong that a public opinion has to be in the vox populi is now the voice for reason and uh, i'm guessing there are a few roman senators turning in their graves when they hear this but uh
I think I can make the claim that Vox Populi is now the voice of sanity in our uh, upside down world. Uh, well, without a doubt, Matt, without a doubt, and the establishment are doing everything they possibly can to thwart that uh, evil, evil concept of populism. The thing that they fear the most is left, right wing, any wing populism. This is what the establishment loathes the most. I'm with Matt Nilsson right now, political analyst and historian. We're going to go to break real quick with TNT. When we come back, we'll continue this discussion and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a few. Speaking on the issues that impact, this is the Patrick Henningsen Show on TNT Radio. All right, folks, welcome back. Welcome back to the program. Um, Basil, uh, we've got a clip I want to run uh, regarding uh, NATO. Let's go ahead and roll that clip, and I want to get both of your comments on this. Go ahead. Let's roll that. President Putin actually sent a, a draft treaty that they wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was what, what he sent us. And that was, that, that was a precondition for not invade uh, 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 Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that. So he went to war to prevent NATO, uh, more NATO close to his borders. Flashback. This is fundamentally not about NATO expansion. It was never about NATO enlargement. It's not about NATO. It's not about NATO expanding toward Russia. This was never about NATO. It's absolutely nothing to do with NATO expansionism. And it has nothing to do with NATO. This, this is not, not about, about NATO. It's not about NATO. It's not really about NATO. This is not about NATO. Seriously. It's not about NATO. This was never about NATO. It was never about NATO. Let's be honest. This doesn't have anything to do with NATO. Nothing to do with NATO at all. Yeah, he's claiming it's like security purposes, but we can see the clear reason. <clears throat> but NATO is not the reason. This is not about NATO expansion. This is about the democratic expansion. Ukraine bans religious organizations. We are protecting democracy right now. Ukraine is banning political parties. Because it's a democracy. Ukraine restricts books and music. It's about democracy. Ukraine won't hold elections. It's about democracy. And it's not about NATO expansion. This war in Ukraine is not about NATO. It's not about NATO. It's not about NATO. It has nothing to do with NATO. Nothing to do with NATO expansion. It's not about NATO expansion. Nothing to do with, with NATO. It isn't really about NATO. It's not about NATO. It's not about NATO enlargement. In fact, it has nothing to do with NATO. It's not about NATO encroaching. So it's not about NATO. NATO is just as a fictitious, imaginary adversary for, for, for Mr. Putin and for Russia. It was never about NATO. That's not what it's been about. It's been about him trying to expand his sphere of influence. Hang on. I mean, the two are not mutually exclusive. Obviously, Russia has wished for a sphere of influence over Ukraine. But if the West had not challenged Russian interests so directly, I think that there, there was a, a chance to avoid this war. He wanted us to sign a promise never to enlarge NATO. We rejected that. The reason why Putin invaded Ukraine is because of his evil. Evil. It's about that Putin wants to rebuild Soviet empire of evil, like President Reagan told. It's about Putin being sick. I don't know how you negotiate peace with a madman, but nobody negotiated with Hitler. People are comparing him to Hitler. To Hitler. And remember Hitler. He's a Hitler. We're back when the Nazis invaded Poland. This is exactly the same what Hitler was doing to Jews. This is the same. Uh, Putin will not stop. Uh, Putin is reminiscent of Hitler. Hitler. This reminds me of Hitler. 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 He's the new Hitler. Well, Hitler. This is about a butcher. I'm totally. trying to kill people everywhere in the world, just not Ukraine, Syria, all over the place. I hear you. Uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, straight ahead. Well, uh, Lindsey Graham there, arguably the most unhinged of all the neocons, uh, with ludicrous claims that Putin wants to kill people all over the world. Unfortunately, the gremlins have taken care of Patrick for the time being. He'll be joining me again by telephone after 5 p.m. But uh, first of all, uh, we had it there in a nutshell in a very well edited little video. Uh, it was indeed NATO expansionism and the NATO's refusal to agree not to expand any further was certainly one of the factors that led to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It wasn't the only. I think the, the main one was the uh, persecution of ethnic Russians in those regions. Uh, now your own country, Matt, sadly, with uh, Viktor Orban signing the declaration today, has also joined NATO. And meanwhile, from the leaked phone call 
from Lieutenant General Ingo Gerhardt, head of the Luftwaffe, we learned that there may very well be British troops on the ground in Ukraine, helping to organize missiles which are sent deep into Russian territory. All this could have been avoided if Victoria Newland had resigned 10 years ago, Max. Uh, perhaps, more or less, but m most definitely a lot of it could have been avoided if uh, the draft peace deal that the Wall Street Journal published uh, a few days ago that was negotiated in, in spring of 2022 between Ukraine and Russia had been accepted. It, it wasn't by any means, at least not what I was able to read, uh, a, a bad deal for, for Ukraine. It, uh, it was very much in favor of Ukraine. It would have been uh, kept, Ukraine would have been kept as a, as a solid sovereign state, uh, min minus uh, Crimea. It could even have become a member of the European Union. The only one restriction was not joining NATO, plus some, uh, some uh, limits on the size of certain parts of its armed forces. Those conditions were m much better than anything Ukraine can hope for today when, when uh, Russia's trust in the West is, is down to, to zero. And, and and as for Sweden's member membership in NATO, it's um, if you look at what Austin uh, said or claimed uh, also a few days ago that uh, Ukraine should enter NATO in order to be protected from Russian attacks, but at this at the same time he said that if and when Russia defeats Ukraine, Russia will continue on to attack NATO member states. So, I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the protective value of a NATO membership for Sweden? If the, Amer if the American Austin says that uh, Russia is going to invade NATO anyway, once it's uh, done with Ukraine, then, then it's null and void. So, so wh why are we even in NATO if it doesn't help us? It's just it's just for show. There's nothing else, and unfortunately, now Sweden will soon officially be part of this uh, sad, sad uh, dance macabre that's called yes. NATO. Uh, that's a very good way of putting it, Matt. Uh, the photos on the wires are of German Defence Minister Boris Pistorius shaking hands with the Swedish Defence Minister. Paul Jonsson during their meeting uh, just today in Solna, not very far from where you are, putting the seal on it after the Hungarian president, uh, Tamás Suljok, whose signature was needed. He added his name to force a bill through parliament in Hungary yesterday, uh, which after 18 months of delays from the Hungarians, um, they put up a bit of a fight. Uh, they have finally given way, and uh, we are one step closer to World War Three. Uh, meanwhile, of course, we've had this explosive revelation that there may well be British troops on the ground in Ukraine, helping Kiev's forces fire long-range storm shadow missiles. Uh, the Kremlin last week said this leak demonstrates the direct involvement of the collective West. And former British Defence Ministers expressed frustration with the German military in response to the revelations. But nobody has denied that they're true. Uh, it is indeed Lieutenant General Ingo Erhardt on the line who said, when it comes to mission planning, I know how the English do it. They do it completely in reach back. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. Uh, they also have a few people on the ground. They do that. Yes. The French yes. don't. Go on, go on, Matt. No, it, it's it's one of these uh, it's one of these uh, open secrets that, of course, some of some of the strikes, especially the strikes uh, sinking parts of the Russian navy within the Black Sea, are coordinated by NATO members of the NATO forces. Now, I think NATO could. Uh, avoid 
this by saying that these representatives are officially on leave from their respective home country's military. So they are not, uh, in a legal sense, part of the British uh, service anymore. Perhaps they're put on a temporary leave to be able to go to Ukraine in case they perhaps are caught or something like that. But, but otherwise, it's of course, NATO troops are already involved. And as for the Black Sea, I, I don't see any real good solution for Russia unless Russia declares all of the Black Sea a no-fly zone uh, and claims that uh, the planes, the American and the British uh, and the other nations' planes that are flying over the Black Sea are aiding uh, attacks on Russia and thereby are legitimate targets. You, you, could, make, uh, you could make that uh, case. However, once this area is declared a no-fly zone by Russia, obviously, it's once again, you're going to ignite a larger war. So it's uh, right now, it's a very tense environment. And uh, uh, Macron's uh, French, typical French posturing isn't doing anyone any good. Uh, so we'll have to see right now what if Schultz is able to uh, oppose the in his the internal pressure in Germany about sending the Taurus and uh, sending German forces to aid in uh, making Ukraine use the Taurus. We, we'll see, but it's uh, it's as you say, it's it's a dangerous time, and this big military uh, uh, training exercise that's right now on the way up here in the north, it's also going to escalate things further. Uh, it's uh, it's stated officially that this is a training exercise in order to be able to uh, push back Russia in case of uh, in case of things going very very wrong. Everyone is dressed up for the war, and uh, the party is probably just getting started. Yes, Macron in Prague today urging Western allies not to be cowardly over their support for Ukraine. I mean, it's so easy to twist language, uh, to use words like cowardly and appeasement, when in fact you're talking about diplomacy and peace. It's always very easy for the war hawks to demonize uh, anybody reaching out to the other side in a bid to build bridges and use pejorative language like that. But uh, in, in case you thought it was April the 1st, it isn't, it's March the 5th, uh, but a story has just broken um, that the head of the Russian space agency has said Moscow and Beijing are seriously considering putting a nuclear power plant on the moon. Yes, you heard me right, a nuclear power plant on the moon. I don't know if this comes in response to uh, the United States ramping up its whole Star Wars project again. But there it is, an absolutely off the charts story. Um, meanwhile, the Germans say they've made no decision yet on sending the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. And Russia says it has scrambled fighter jets to escort French planes over the Black Sea. Moscow says it scrambled an Su-27 to escort French fighter jets and a reconnaissance plane. I assume they were not meant to be there, Mats, but perhaps that's what Macron means by not being cowardly. He means winding up the Russians by sending his jets uh, very close to Russian airspace. I wonder how he would feel if the Russians were flying over the Mediterranean just off the Côte d'Azur. Well, I think he, he would feel the way most French leaders feel. He would run and hide, historically. Uh, <laughs> as, 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 for, as for the moon and the nuclear uh, energy on the moon, I, I would like to put a positive uh, news story up here on, on, on uh, TNT. The, uh, two days ago, three NASA astronauts and a Russian cosmonaut, and I think a be Belarusian as well, headed for the International Space Station uh, together uh, on one of the Soyuz uh, ferry ships. Uh, 
Uh, so they, they were actually l launched up into the International Space Center together. So obviously, sanctions don't apply everywhere, and uh, and on on a on a between on a personal level, it, it's always good to see that there actually are some areas where cooperation is still possible. Possible, and uh, as as long as that exists, maybe who knows? Maybe the leaders might come through as well and snap back into some sort of of sanity. But uh, obviously, the the prevailing uh, prevailing mo mood right now is war and more conflict and escalatory talk. Words matter, and what we're lacking today are leaders of stature. We're, we're lacking leaders who have the ability to say, "We now need we now need the, the Georgia war and not the war war." But they don't exist. Uh, and sadly, the United Nations is the general secretary of the United Nations. I, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him. He should be flying shuttle traffic between Moscow, Washington, London, Berlin, Jerusalem, uh, Riyadh, Cairo. He should be out there doing continuous diplomacy to bring about talks and to bring about peace. But I, I haven't seen him. I haven't even seen any news about him. I don't know where he is. It's situations like these, this, where a, a person like the UN General Secretary needs to rise to the occasion and start yes. making some noise. But 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 the United Nations, they they have They've just taken a break, gone down to the pub for a pint, and you know, oh well, there, there's a war on. Well, we're we're not going to do anything about it. Let someone else sort it out, which is sad, because it it makes me a, a fond admirer of the UN system. It makes me question what's the use of the United Nations. And if I'm questioning the United questioning the United Nations, I'm guessing a whole lot of other people are questioning. In, the use of the United Nations as well. Yes, I don't think the United Nations Security Council location there in New York is very helpful. It's a long way from the action, you know, um, United States, North America, Canada, uh, you know, no major wars actually on that soil since what the American Civil War in the middle of the 19th century. I think if the United Nations was in Geneva or something, a little bit closer to the action, uh, be it in Gaza or the Ukraine, um, they may well be a little bit more focused on what's going on. As it is, the whole thing these days increasingly looks like a film set from a 1960s James Bond film. And uh, the people in the Security Council, simply actors, uh, you know, empty, you know, mouthing empty platitudes endlessly. Um, but not actually getting on with the nitty gritty, which is supposed to be, as you say, Matt, preventing wars and preventing escalation of conflicts. Yes, good, good, uh, good, Gutierrez could get on a plane and and uh, and leave New yes. York. Gutierrez is is movable. The the United Nations isn't. It's stuck in New York for the foreseeable future. But the fact that Gutierrez is is uh, not anywhere to be see, to be seen is detrimental to the whole future of the UN system, especially in I a time Ma like this. I thought Macron was supposed to be one of the more, for all his background and everything, one of the saner and more reasonable actors. But he said today in Prague that we are well aware that war is back on our soil, in Europe that is, that some powers which have become unstoppable are extending every day their threat of attacking us even more and that we will have to live up to history and the courage that it requires. He did not elaborate further on what he meant. I mean, who is planning on attacking France, Matt? Nobody. No one. Nobody. And, 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 and I, you have to remember, this is the fellow who in, uh, let's see, 2018 or tw uh, 2019, he's the one who said that uh, NATO was brain dead. Uh, no. That... Uh, that NATO had no future, and the future of security within Europe was within Europe itself. And suddenly, he's now promoting NATO as uh, the number one 
uh, organization to take the fight towards Russia. Uh, obviously, France isn't threatened by, by anyone. Uh, it hasn't been f for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, it's uh, I don't know what's gotten into him. If he's trying no. to compensate for something else or, or if he's trying to play tough in order to gain votes, I don't think it's going to do yeah. him any good because no. the voters aren't particularly interested in a war. And Like I said before, the Vox Populi of Europe is right now the sane voice. And that's, that's seldom happened in history, uh, might I add. So we are, uh, we're still at a crossroad, and, uh, but this, everything is leaning towards a path taken that's going to cause uh, more suffering and uh, more yes. death amongst a whole generation of uh, European youngsters. Yes. Uh, the ana well, the analogy to uh, 1914 still holds firm. Un unfortunately, it does. When we were all playing cricket and punting on the River Cam, um, people were blissfully complacent before hostilities broke out in September of that dreadful year. Max Nielsen, I can't thank you enough for joining us today on today's news talk. Always tremendously incisive analysis from Sweden and uh, it's hoped that your country's accession to NATO does not mean a meaningful increase in tension. Thank you, Max. We'll be back Thank you, after Basil. the break. I'll be joined on the phone by Patrick Henningsen. We'll be pivoting over to the Middle East. We'll be right back.